August 2021, we uh, lost um, everything. Medical crisis, health crisis, humanitarian crisis, educational crisis, economic crisis, the community goes, country goes into crisis. This situation is very, really da um, dangerous for all of our family. Women do not have freedom in any part of Taliban-controlled Afghanistan. My message to, to the women of Afghanistan that things will change one day. Never be disappointed. Never give up. The truth is, this did unfold more quickly than we had anticipated. Uh, well, uh, 15th August was a, a very important day in the, in the history of Afghanistan. All the achievement which women of Afghanistan made just lost in, in, in a few hours. I was in Kabul and uh, around 11 o'clock in the morning, I realized that most of uh, area of my constituency in a, in a critical situation, I myself really scared inside Kabul because you, you don't know if anything happened, women will be the first target and women are always the, the soft target. So I prefer to leave the house. I didn't take my car. I didn't take my stuff. I went with my sister secretary, his private car, and hide myself there. Next morning, I went to the airport with my son, but I couldn't enter. It was a terrible situation. All the youth, they just surrounded the, the airport to catch the plane. It was Wednesday afternoon. I could enter, stay at the airport on Thursday, Friday morning, I left for Bahrain and uh, two nights spent there. And next uh, day, which was Sunday, I left for America. So one Sunday, government collapsed. Next Sunday, I was in the U.S. We, we never thought the government or the system will be totally collapsed and will be given to the hand of Taliban without or unconditionally or guaranteed women's right on human rights of Afghanistan. Shinkai um, is a member of parliament, Afghan parliament, but she was also the Canadian ambassador. Um, Mina's list helped evacuate her to the US. We had been intimately involved in the peace process. And so once the announcement of the unconditional withdrawal um, came out, um, we knew that the women activists that we worked with and specifically the women political leaders that we worked with were gonna be on the top of the Taliban's hit list. Late July, I realized that most of the women political leaders weren't on anybody's evacuation lists because nobody expected Kabul to fall that quickly. And so I started I reached out to honestly private individuals to see who could help provide evacuation opportunities for these women political leaders and with partners um, in, in Greece and um, an international, I mean, Ramad Khan in the Khan Foundation, um, we ran evacuations for the women political leaders for three and a half weeks with my colleagues from different NGOs and different entities, trying to get as many people as we could to the airport before the airport closed. Since the, 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 the Taliban took over, uh, in some ways, things all look very much as they did before. What has changed is you certainly see far fewer women on the streets and they are now much more likely to be covered up more than they were before.
they have allowed uh, younger age groups of girls to go to school, uh, but uh, despite making, they did make a, a promise at one point that they would uh, reopen all sc girls schools, but then they reversed. They abandoned that decision at the, at the moment it was going to happen. And so you do not see older girls, older girls going to school. And they will even say this is to, is to have babies and to, to, to stay at home. Educated women, in the view of some, a threat to their rule because they will challenge uh, they will challenge the way that the, 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 the Taliban operate. The problem was that the first thing that the Taliban did was not reopen the schools post vacations or summer vacations, and they have been closed since then. So what we did was, because those schools were closed down, we started a secret school post-September. We teach them biophysics, chemistry, and mathematics, but we also teach them um, skills, which is digital uh, learning or digital skills like 2D animation, graphic designing, stuff that would help them earn some money. They will be in danger. They still are in danger. It's never easy to tell uh, the parents of 100 girls to send their daughters to school. All the women that work with us are working illegally. So if they're caught, they could be put in jail. They could be murdered. But we are here and we have to accept those as challenges. Girls' education is a sensitive subject and they know it's political, so they're using it. We actually, um, our office building, our office building was uh, taken by um, the Taliban in September last year. We had done some really uh, major and fundamental work for um, improving Afghan businesswomen's uh, situation. They had created over 130,000 jobs plus employing themselves that we wanted to make sure that both at national and international level, Afghan women get the recognition of economic actors and not economic beneficiaries all the time. All of us have seen Afghan women as economic dependents. We have always thought that, oh, poor Afghan women, uh, they have breadwinners, men are uh, bringing for them and they are at home. Even though they were at home, they were very much in the background, but they were major economic producers with the restrictions that uh, Taliban have imposed on women since they've come, uh, like a movement with a male companion, this is a big restriction on informal businesses. They would come, buy their raw material, they would go back to their villages and their districts, they would make uh, their productions with all the women artisans in their villages. They will come back, bring their finished goods and sell it in the cities street harassments increased after um, Taliban announced their policy on, on hijab. And we have a lot of stories of um, women um, were stopped um, on various checkpoints, on, on various streets in Kabul, Herat, Mazar, all cities that, oh, you don't have a black uh, veil or black uh, covering, go home. Oh, you have makeup on, go home and change. So, of course, once these restrictions are in place, women themselves feel more fear than any other time to go out. In general, um, they, it's, it's more, it tends to be that they're perhaps covering their faces. The key thing, though, of course, is that a lot of them have now lost their jobs because they're not being um, they're, they're not being allowed to work. And so one of the things that you see in, in cities across the country is people selling their belongings. And so you can be driving along a street and 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 you will see rows of um, you know household items, beds, sleeping cushions, you see um, all kinds of other furniture, uh, cooking implements. People are selling basic things. Uh, so that they can uh, get enough money, enough cash to, um, to to get food. And of course, at the worst level, that has meant in the rural areas, which are even poorer, there have been lots and lots of cases of people effectively starving. Afghanistan was obviously a very poor country beforehand, um, but you are now basically squeezing an economy that was already under a lot of strain. 
and that is making a, a lot of people poorer and poorer. And because of the sanctions, Afghanistan is arguably more cut off than, say, Russia is at the moment from the international uh, financial system. Because, for instance, the, the SWIFT the Swift system, Afghanistan's been cut off from that. All Afghan banks have been cut off from using that since August last year. Whereas, of course, some Russian banks still have access to SWIFT because people want to be able to pay for the, the, the oil. We can't, because of the banking restrictions, you know, we can't pay for sufficient imports because they can't send money outside the country and then if they do get products out, it's very hard to actually get paid uh, for the, the, anything that they're, they're making. This, that's just a microcosm of the kind of the problems. And so, so yes, aid is going in, which is helping people, but that is no substitute for a, a properly functioning economy. So the country, is in, the country is in crisis. The country is in crisis. And at the moment, there is no sign of that ending. And we will we'll try to uh, take control over the organization back in terms of like its Kabul office and uh, some of our um, resources. Right after August 2021, we um, continued virtually. And it was good that um, the COVID situation in 2020 taught us all how to use technology to continue um, our um, services and activities. We uh, transferred all the information, especially our database, because we had created a very unique database of uh, Afghan businesswomen in Afghanistan. And we also started to put together a sales platform. And we've just finished the work of that online sales uh, platform, and they will start hopefully uh, soon uh, making use of the technology to um, sell their products online. Uh, not only within, but uh, especially outside of Afghanistan. And uh, we have um, worked on specific routes for them to shape, to ship their um, uh, products. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it didn't matter where I was. Uh, that was not very much um, a big concern because uh, with technology, of course, I mean, um, you're able to, to work wherever you are. I mean, things went so bad but it's the best time that now Afghan businesswomen spread uh, are spread around the world. All of us have been active uh, with the international uh, community. And then, uh, yeah, we have to continue demanding that we need Afghan women to uh, continue their um, normal life uh, in Afghanistan as they used to have having it in the last 20 years. Yes, our country is facing a lot of uh, economic challenges. I personally think I cannot solve all of Afghanistan's economic challenges, but these 400 girls that come to our school, we teach them digital skills and we put them up on Fiverr and LinkedIn and uh, on this local website called Riyagan Khan where they can actually learn uh, and continue to post their uh, work. So if someone has uh, digital skills, if someone has website development skills, they're paid $150 or $200 for their work. So I cannot maybe solve the whole Afghanistan challenge, but uh, for these 400 girls, we do have a good footing. So I think social media plays a very important role, even if it's looked down upon, even if it's not super respected. And the only reason we publish the pictures of the girls on our media is to show um, that this is the sort of resistance towards the Taliban's policies, where they're like, we're shutting down schools. We tell them that under your nose, we're still operating the schools. So, you know, the challenge that we give them, we are not picking up arts. We're not doing any bloodshed. We have currently enrolled more than 400 girls in our these current schools. And most importantly, we are still challenging the narrative of uh, Taliban about a girl's education in Afghanistan. And we are doing it through social media, through media outlets, through writing, through testimonials from the girls. 
but amazing um, because one of the things that I have found through my work, you know, women's rights activists um, and, and women in general, um, is that the women and girls in Afghanistan are actually continuing to speak out against the, the Taliban. They've, you know, had um, protests in the street, um, mobilized on social media. Um, of course, the ramifications against these women um, has been extreme. Um, uh, while the Taliban might not um, break up the protest while it's on public media, we know um, most of those women um, have been arrested afterwards and detained and tortured. You know, every time they speak out, there's these very, very harsh consequences. Financial resources, international resources moved from Afghanistan to Ukraine months after the situation. It is easy for us to shift our attention, but we have to continue to pay attention um, because what happens to Afghan women matters to women everywhere. It's what we're willing to accept, you know, as an international community, as human society. Um, you know, we have collectively failed Afghan women, but it's not too late. This doesn't have to be the future. If we stop paying attention um, and think that it's their problem, then I am deeply fearful um, for what the future holds for Afghan women and, and girls. Afghan women are a strong fighter. They are strong enough to tolerate what's going on. And one day they will overcome uh, to all these uh, uh, challenges which they are facing. And finally, Taliban or other government will accept women's inclusion and women's rights in Afghanistan because we believe none of the government could run uh, without women's inclusion, without women's support, or by violating women's and girls' fundamental rights. My message to, to the woman of Afghanistan that be strong, things will change one day. Never be disappointed, never give up. We all are with you. We will support you. We will ask the international not to compromise on women's rights in Afghanistan. We, we request the international community to stand and support human rights and women's rights in Afghanistan.